Hello, Booktube. I wanted to make a short video about a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called Roger Melvin's Burial. It's a story that I think about a lot. So just two quick points of introduction. This video is going to contain a discussion of war, modern warfare, and many of its attendant horrors. And so that's a content warning. And Introduction point number two. Um, there's some pretty jarring racism in the story. So I just want to leave that as a question to you, the viewers. You know, what, what do you do with that? Um, you know, maybe it's not a story worth making a video about. If you think that's the case, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Before jumping into the story and its plot, uh, I want to talk a bit about some of the things I've learned about warfare in my reading, because I think it helps provide a little bit of context for the themes and the scenarios that get addressed in the story. I've learned from my reading that a sense of moral guilt plays a surprisingly large outsized role in the experience, in the occurrence of psychological injuries. There's obviously an infinite number of ways to endure a psychological injury, to endure long-term trauma. But one of the elements that seems to really exacerbate the effects of trauma, of a traumatic experience, is a sense on the part of a combatant that they are morally guilty. Obviously, in warfare, there's a myriad number of ways to let down your fellow combatants, to not be there when they need you, to fail them. And of course, something which doesn't get spoken a lot about, it's a reality, it's a element of modern warfare. In the fog of war, there's always going to be friendly fire incidents uh, with noisy communication channels and the mess and the noise and the confusion of just a modern battlefield. There will always be accidents and mistakes. In this respect, I'm reminded of a broadcast on Israeli television that I once saw a few years ago. Someone sent it to me and it really haunted me. It was a segment on Israeli television in Hebrew about how the government and the army is letting down, it's, it's failing it's soldiers, that you have all these soldiers who come back from war with post-traumatic stress disorder and they're not getting the help they need. And this broadcast focused on one particular soldier. The soldier is dealing with crippling, crippling post-traumatic stress disorder. It goes without saying that he cannot hold down a job, he cannot focus, he has severe, severe night terrors. and. The experience that he had was he accidentally killed a friend of his in battle. And he describes how his friend visits him in nightmares, in a ghastly state from beyond the grave, and says, what did you do to me? What did you do to me? And it makes life almost impossible. It makes life uh, a living nightmare for this particular soldier. Another part of the broadcast, they, they talk to the soldier and they talk to the father of this other soldier, the second soldier, the soldier who was killed in the friendly fire incident, the soldier who was killed by the first soldier who has the post-traumatic stress disorder. So they talk to the father of the second soldier who was killed and he tells the story and the first soldier also, they, they tell the story together that at the funeral for this soldier who was killed in the friendly fire incident, the first soldier is crying hysterically, sobbing, tears running down his face. And he goes to the father and he says, I killed your son. And the father embraced the soldier and he said, you are my son now. It's okay. You are my son. Another element of warfare, 
which is not often discussed. I've seen it in a few places. There's a scene that speaks to this in All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark, which I have there. But I imagine it's much more common than you'd think. I imagine it's an element, it's an aspect that comes up in all warfare and it's just very taboo and not spoken about. In combat, soldiers sustain injuries that are horrific and are not survivable because of the din of war, because of the chaos of war, because of the, ac the lack of access or the futility of medicine to treat these injuries. These are terminal injuries. And there's this question of, do you kill your friend on the battlefield who has no chance of surviving? Again, this is not often discussed. I've rarely seen this addressed, but there's a scene in All Quiet on the Western Front like this, and there are a few other places where I've seen it come up. So all that is by way of introduction. These are sort of the texts and the stories that go through my mind when I read Roger Melvin's Burial. After a short introduction about the context of this uh, Lovell's fight, which is the battle against the Native Americans that the book um, is set, that the book uh, addresses, quote, the early sunbeams hovered cheerfully upon the treetops, beneath which two weary and wounded men had stretched their limbs the night before. Their bed of withered oak leaves was strewn upon the small level space at the foot of a rock, situated near the summit of one of the gentle swells by which the face of the country is there diversified. The massive granite rearing its smooth flat surface 15 or 20 feet above their heads was not unlike a gigantic tombstone upon which the veins seemed to form an inscription in forgotten characters. End quote. And so in the scene, we have Roger Malvin and Reuben, two characters. They've in, they're injured in this fight against the Native Americans. And Roger Malvin is going to die, it seems. Together, they can't make it back to civilization. And they have this long dialogue, this long discussion, where Roger Malvin is begging Reuben, go without me. Together we can't make it, but alone you can make it. Leave me here to die. And Reuben understandably doesn't want to leave Roger Malvin. Eventually, Roger Malvin is able to convince Reuben to go. Roger Malvin has a daughter. Her name is Dorcas. And Reuben is engaged to be married to Dorcas. And so Roger Malvin says, go, marry my daughter, form a family, live your life. Don't worry about me. And Reuben is conflicted. He's really conflicted. But eventually his desire for life, his urge to preserve himself, overtakes his, overcomes his desire to not abandon his dying friend. And he goes. Here's the description we get of Rod Roger Malvin, left alone under this rock, under the slab of granite, as Reuben is leaving him to die by himself. Quote, Roger Malvin's hands were uplifted in a fervent prayer, some of the words of which stole through the stillness of the woods and entered Reuben's heart, torturing it with an unutterable pang. I'm skipping ahead now. And as the youth listened, conscience or something in its similitude pleaded strongly with him to return and lie down again by the rock. He felt how hard was the doom of the kind and generous being whom he had deserted in his extremity. Death would come like the slow approach of a corpse, stealing gradually towards him through the forest and showing its ghastly and motionless features from behind a nearer and yet a nearer tree. But such must have been Reuben's own fate had he tarried another sunset. And who shall impute blame to him if he shrink from so useless a sacrifice? As he gave a parting look, a breeze waved the little banner upon the sapling oak. 
and reminded Reuben of his vow, end quote. And that vow that was referenced at the end is that Reuben made a vow to Roger Malvin to eventually return and bury his bones. Nathaniel Hawthorne doesn't use the language of PTSD that we have today, but what he describes in Reuben after he returns home really sounds a lot exactly like a modern PTSD kind of description. He describes Reuben being irritable, being much less pleasant. Uh, and part of the problem for Reuben is that he can't admit, he wasn't able to admit to Dorcas, to the people of his town, that he abandoned Roger Malvin. He's so haunted by that. And so he tells everyone that he buried Roger Malvin the best he could, which of course is a lie. And of course created a problem for him because it made it much harder for him to go back and fulfill his promise to bury Roger Malvin because he told everyone that Roger Malvin was buried. And Reuben is eventually tormented and he's really undermined by this experience. And his farm starts to fail. As other people's farms are being successful, he's, he's a failure. A description of Reuben. Quote, By a certain association of ideas, he at times almost imagined himself a murderer. For years, also, a thought would occasionally recur, which, though he perceived all its folly and extravagance, he had not power to banish from his mind. It was a haunting and torturing fancy that his father-in-law was yet sitting at the foot of the rock on the withered forest leaves alive and awaiting his pledged assistance. These mental deceptions, however, came and went, nor did he ever mistake them for realities. But in the calmest and clearest moods of his mind, he was conscious that he had a deep vow unredeemed, and that an unburied corpse was calling to him out of the wilderness. End quote. In Reuben's experience, in Reuben's mind, he's haunted by a ghost. I'm also reminded of a scene in one of my favorite books about modern war, Dispatches by Michael Herr. Which I have right here. About the Vietnam War. The author, Michael Herr, describing the ways in which he's haunted from his experiences. Quote, One night, like a piece of shrapnel that takes years to work its way out. I dreamed and saw a field that was crowded with dead. I was crossing it with a friend, more than a friend, a guide, and he was making me get down and look at them. They were powdered with dust, bloodied, like it had been painted on with a wide brush. Some were blown out of their pants, just like they looked that day, being thrown onto the truck at Cantho, and I said, but I've already seen them. My friend didn't say anything. He just pointed. And I leaned down again, and this time I looked into their faces. End quote. And so just this being haunted by the dead, and in Roger Malvin's experience, he feels like he abandoned someone still alive. There's no closure. There's no closure. He never saw Roger Malvin dead. The story continues in very dramatic fashion. Reuben and Dorcas have a son named Cyprus, their only son. And of course, Roger Malvin has great affection for his son in which he sees a lot of himself. And they have to leave their town because Reuben's farm is a failure and they have no money at this point. They have to set off on their own. So the three of them, Reuben, Dorcas, and Cyprus set out into the woods. And Reuben is constantly veering off course. And Cyprus says to his father, Father, we're going the wrong way. We need to be going this direction. And Reuben says, you're right, you're right, sorry. But he keeps veering off course for reasons he can't really understand. And at one point after they sort of stopped trying to correct course and they've been veering off course for a while now, they stop to make a camp. And Dorcas 
is going to cook some food and boil some water and make a fire and she's singing happily and her husband and her son go out to hunt to kill a deer for their meal and Reuben and Cyprus go off in separate directions but as if pulled by uh, an invisible magnet Reuben is curving in this path he's not walking straight and out of the corner of his eye, eventually he thinks he sees a deer and he shoots. And of course, it's his son. He shoots his son and kills him dead on the spot. And when he finally comes over to the dead body and he looks around, he sees that the spot where his son is lying is exactly the same spot where he left Roger Malvin to die 18 years earlier, if I remember correctly in the story with that same granite tombstone and now I will read that part of the story quote then Reuben's heart was stricken and the tears gushed out like water from a rock the vow that the wounded youth had made the blighted man came to redeem his sin was expiated the curse was gone from him and in the hour when he had shed blood dearer to him than his own a prayer the first for years went up to heaven from the lips of Reuben Born end quote and that's the end of the story and it's, it's a tough ending. It's obviously a troubling ending. It's sort of hard to make sense of for me. You know, why, why does killing his son expiate the sin? Where does that come from? Like, what's just going on psychologically speaking? But what seems to me to be relatively clear is that in Reuben's mind, he left a man to die. And like a vengeful God, that man that he left to die needed his payment in the accidental sacrifice of his own son. He pays that debt. Thanks for watching.